The best way to do creativity is come up with a bunch of ideas, some more wild than others, and then test them. Test them cheap and fast, like low fidelity crude experiments. So if an idea doesn't work, you don't burn down that company. You, you, you try it for, for 10 bucks on a Tuesday afternoon. And if it doesn't work out, so what? It's time! Work! Play! Evolve! I want to connect the listeners to the best of the best. Welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. I am your host, Pat Costello, the co-founder and principal at Evolve MGA. Our mission for the podcast is to bring the insurance industry the best of the best. My guest today is the most booked innovation speaker in the world. He is self-described as a creative troublemaker. He has been the founder and CEO of five tech companies, which sold for a combined value of over $200 million. He's an internationally recognized expert on innovation and is the author of four books on the subject, including the New York Times bestsellers, Discipline Dreaming and The Road to Reinvention. His name is is Josh Linkner. Josh is incredibly passionate about starting companies, building companies, and unlocking the creative potential within a business. Some really big names like Magic Johnson, Seth Godin, and Steve Case, who's the co-founder and former CEO of AOL, among many others, have recommended his talks. We discussed how individuals in the insurance world can maximize innovation and creativity within our industry. Please download, subscribe, and leave a review on whatever platform you are listening on. And feel free to reach out to me at pat at evolvedbrokerpodcast.com with any comments or suggestions for the podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by First Insurance Funding. First is the leading premium finance company in insurance and is known throughout the industry for their personalized service and quote flexibility. If you're tired of sending quote requests for smaller premiums to multiple companies, not leaving enough time to negotiate larger opportunities, then choose FIRST as your primary financing source and experience the FIRST difference today. Without further ado, here's Josh. Josh, welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. Great to be with you. Thanks for having me. You have one of the most epic titles of anyone that we've recorded with, which is the world's most booked speaker when it comes to innovation. And I am uh, uniquely interested to have you on because uh, one of your books, Hacking Innovation, it, it has almost the exact same hacker logo that we have on our website for our cyber insurance business, uh, which is um, specifically insurance that covers costs associated with hacking attacks. So I feel like we got a lot to talk about today. Um, but I'd love if you could just give maybe just a little download on your background and what inspired you to write the book, Hacking Innovation. Yeah. So me in a nutshell, uh, I'm a bit of an odd duck. Uh, I started my career as a jazz guitarist. Uh -huh. I still play regularly. I'm very passionate about music. I started a tech company at age 20 and over the next 32 years, started, built and sold five tech companies. I was the CEO of each of them. Exit value of over $200 million, uh, created over 10,000 jobs. Uh, in 2010, I started a venture capital firm. And last year, I started a second venture firm. So I've been involved in the launch or scale of about 100 startups. I'm very passionate about sort of building and scaling tech companies. Uh, but the other thread is, as you point out, I'm an author. So I've written four books on this topic that I'm very passionate about, which is human creativity. It's something that we all have and don't, don't always fully use. So I've written four books on, on innovation and creativity, including hacking innovation. Uh -huh. and, and my most recent book is called uh, Big Little Breakthroughs, How Small Everyday Innovations Drive Oversized Results. So I'm a jazz musician, an entrepreneur, a venture capital investor, an author, and uh, delighted to be your podcast guest today. Great. Some of the takeaways from your book, Hacking Innovation, have to do with the mindset and the tactics of hackers and how you can really use those philosophies for good can you expand on the mindset of a hacker and, and how someone in the business world could utilize that for 
the betterment of their business? Sure. So when I when I wrote the um, when I wrote, wrote the book Hacking Innovation, uh, the new growth model from the sinister world of hackers, I was looking for a you know a, a fresh approach to uh, to innovation, and um, I realized that some of the most innovative people on the world in the world are, are hackers. You know, putting their you know mischievous intent aside, not so easy to hack into a bank. And so I thought, what what would happen if I studied hackers and their mindsets and and habits and tactics? Not to promote crime, of course not, but more like what could we learn from them and bring back and put into use in legitimate ways. So I spent a couple of years actually. I interviewed um, uh, I, I interviewed ex felons. I interviewed cybersecurity experts. I interviewed uh, uh, law enforcement. And really, again, trying to get inside the mindset of hackers, once again, not, not to promote anything bad, but so we can learn and grow from them. And, and, and they do a couple of really interesting things. You know, w- w- one thing that hackers tend to do is a philosophy I call compasses over maps. And basically what that means is that like, let's say you, you got, you're going uh, to a different city and you got a Google map. Well, the Google map tells you exactly where to go. Take a left here, go four miles, take a right, and you can just turn your brain off. But the problem is if there's a construction or something happens in route, you, you, you don't know what to do with yourself because you're not, you're not figuring it out on your own. The hackers do something called compasses over maps where they set a direction, like I want to get to a specific spot or I want to infiltrate a particular uh, system. And then, but they, they are willing to bob and weave and course correct as conditions change. So they're using more of like their ingenuity along the way rather than relying on a set of instructions. Mm. Got you. Okay. Very interesting. Um, Do you have any examples of businesses that have implemented some of these strategies or particularly thought about approaching a situation like a hacker that resulted in tremendous success? Yeah, I mean, there there are dozens of them. Another principle that that hackers embrace is called um, every barrier can be penetrated. So so when they see some new security uh, patch, they don't like throw up their arms and say, well, I guess I going to quit now and go to Wendy's. Like they say, I'm going to figure this out. And and we see that very often in in, in business where where a company has a setback, they're facing some type of really serious challenge, but then they're willing to to sort of figure out a path forward. They find their way as opposed to as as opposed to uh, to, to admitting you know or, or, or succumbing to defeat, mm-hmm. and and there's, there's there's dozens of examples of this. I mean, right here in my hometown, you know, General Motors is probably a big but but good example. You know, they, they had everything going wrong. They had a they had bankruptcy. They they were in in very bad spot. They had this airbag issue that was a big problem, and people died. And like they could have thrown in the towel, but Mary Barrett takes over and and admits her her problems and, and sort of sees her path forward. She believed that even as difficult and clunky and bureaucratic as things were, there had to be a way to solve it. And today, you know, the company is really thriving and, and pushing the boundaries of mobility and technology and, and doing uh, remarkably well. Wow, that's, that's really interesting. You know, another company that comes to mind that I'm sure you're familiar with because you're a big Detroit guy is Shinola Watches. H- have you had any experience um, seeing how they've approached things? I've just heard... Um, stories about how they've kind of taken the Detroit grit and um, manufacturing ability and applied it to the watch world. Yeah, it's funny if I know those guys very well and I was involved as they were thinking about Detroit. And, mm-hmm. and they're actually a good example of that compasses over maps, uh, which is we described. So they wanted to build a an American handmade watch, which ironically, they're, they're up to that point, there were no longer any handmade watch, watches here made here in America. Mm-hmm. And so they licensed this old brand, which had sort of this nostalgic vibe of, of, of Shinola. People kind of knew it. It was funny and catchy and all that. Mm-hmm. But they, they weren't from Detroit, actually. They were from uh, Texas. Ah. And they started doing focus. So their, their goal, the, the problem they were solving for is build a, a, an American watch brand. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like, I'm going to build something in Detroit. Anyway, they print on the face and, and they started doing focus groups like made in the United States, made in Newark, made in Chicago. And then they did made in Detroit. And it, the, the focus group, like it resonated, it blew off the charts. Like, uh-huh. oh, maybe it was it was testing error. So they kept retesting. And there was something about this gritty, you know, handmade nature of Detroit with Shinola that just came together and ignited people's hearts. And so based on that research, even though they didn't intend to start in Detroit, they, they followed where the data led them, opened up here in Detroit. And, and the rest is history. The company is wildly successful. They actually now have a Shinola a hotel in Detroit and it expanded into bicycles and, and leather goods and other cool things. Very cool. Very cool. I actually, I have one myself. I was, it was actually given to me as a gift. And so I, I heard a little bit of the background, but I appreciate you clarifying that. 
that's very interesting to hear. And it's, it's always cool to support those American made products. If I am running an insurance agency and I am looking to be more creative and innovative about how I run my business so that I can be as competitive as possible. Is there a place that you think I should start? Um, yes. So first of all, I think it's crucial that we acknowledge that human creativity isn't just for the fun of it. It, it really can become one of, if not the most effective competitive advantages. You know, many of the advantages of the past have, have gone away. You, know, you can, can't control geography, you know, in insurance, there's, there's, there's competitors all up and down. There's fintech startups. There's large, large brokers, et cetera. And, and, um, and, and, and the world is changing quickly and it's, it's, it's complex. Um, but, but human cr creativity is something that one can, can harness and control. And it's often misunderstood. You know, we think of creativity as playing music or, or painting a, a, a picture. But we can be creative in the way that we uncover new prospects or the way that we, you know, cross all uh, uh, products to, uh, to, to customers and everywhere in between. And so I think it's acknowledging that this is something worth pursuing. And then it's about taking baby steps. You know, very often we think of innovation as like a single lightning bolt and, or, or these high risk moonshot kind of things. That's a really sloppy way to innovate. A better approach is what I wrote about in my most recent book, Big Little Breakthroughs, which is looking for small micro innovations, daily acts of little baby creative, creative approaches because they're way less risky they're way more accessible to more people. It's a more pragmatic approach to being creative. And it might be something simple as tweaking the way you send a proposal in a, in a fresh, creative way that, that enough of those little wins add up to very big breakthroughs. Okay, okay, got you. Yeah, so trying to practice the daily habits of creativity is really good. And from what I've read and what I've seen in terms of your videos, it sounds like you prefer the, the company-wide or um, every employee approach to creativity. Is there a way that you think managers or employers should encourage creativity in like the frontline staff? The biggest blocker of creativity is not natural talent. Actually, as human beings, we're hardwired to be creative. That's like our natural state. But the biggest blocker is fear. And, and too often, leaders build a fear-based culture. Simply put, fear and creativity cannot coexist. And so the thing that we can do as leaders to encourage other people to be creative is try to remove the fear, creating a safe environment where all ideas are celebrated, not just the ones that, that, that you know, are, are, are perfect. Mm -hmm. And so the things that we can do is we can encourage uh, and reward failure. Uh, one of the people I interviewed in my new book, a wildly successful company, every week, they, hold, they have a ritual. Every Friday, they call it F Up Fridays. I mean, they say the whole word. I'll just be polite here. <laughs> but here's, how, here's, what, here's what they do for F Up Fridays. Full company meeting. Each person in the entire company, one by one, has to stand up and proudly share what they effed up that week and what they learned from it. Inevitably, they get to someone that didn't F something up that week, and everyone's like, well, why not? What are you going to try next week? Uh -huh. So uh -huh. just think about this, the, the impact of this simple zero-cost tactic. It tells everybody that, listen, part of being in this job, part of your responsibility is to be innovative. Mm. That we got your back when you when you take a risk and it doesn't work out. That's okay. Let's learn from it together. We we will celebrate you in success and failure, and that we we are a company that celebrates every person being an innovator. And so feel free to embrace that, anyone listening. But when I use that technique or something else like it, the more that we can do to ritualize a safe environment, that alone will unlock the natural gift of human creativity that all of us share. Do you think that there's any downsides to that, like in terms of pushing the pendulum too far? Um, where, I don't know, maybe maybe too much over-testing and over analyzation could be an inhibitor to growth? Um, no, I really don't because the, the, the counterbalance there is judgment. So people will say things like, oh, if my people all start getting all creative, what if they draw on the walls of purple crayons and they burn all their client relationships <laughs> or they, they do something illegal? Like, yeah, I'm not saying you should have bad judgment. I'm saying you yeah. should explore fresh possibilities. So as yeah. long as we're coupling uh, creativity with like being an adult and being mature, I right. don't think you're going to go too far. Because what I'm also not suggesting is, again, taking these wild risks. The best way to do creativity is come up with a bunch of ideas, some more wild than others, and then test them. Yeah. Test them cheap and fast, like low fidelity crude experiments. So if an idea doesn't work, you don't burn down that company. You, you, you try it for, for 10 bucks on a Tuesday afternoon. And if yeah. it doesn't work out, so what? 
And so, so the, the better approach that to, to de-risk creativity is high velocity of experimentation. The best ex leaders are the best experimenters. And that, that, that is the counterbalance for someone becoming or a company becoming too creative. Okay. Okay. Got you. Well, I think this is great because we just came off our company events in Mexico. And I think, um, it could be a really cool thing to include at a future event to break up into focus groups and, and potentially, inst like I guess, give people the ability in the future after one of these events to go out and um, maybe uh, in their specific job responsibility to, b to, to give some responsibility to these folks to be more innovative in certain ways. That's just where my mind's going based off what we just did, where I think it was awesome company event. You know, Josh, one of the stories that comes to mind when I think about you and I think about your background and the videos that you have online is the story about the children's hospital and the how the window washers dressed up as superheroes. Can you, I, I think that's a great example for the audience to hear. Can you provide um, some context on that story and how effective it was in terms of um, having an impact on on the patients and, and the workers in the hospital? Sure. So, you know, too often we think that innovation only counts if it's a billion dollar idea or if it changes the universe, you know, like inventing the printing press. Yeah, that, that's innovative, but, but th those types of innovations are out of reach for most of us. So again, I really encourage people to think about the small innovations that are within the grasp of us all. And one, one example that you're referring to is the Children's Hospital at the University of Pittsburgh. So they were trying to create a better experience for their customers who are sick kids and their families. So the leaders came up with this idea to dress the window washers up like superheroes. So you've got like, now instead of just a generic window washer, you got Batman and Superman and Spider-Man repelling from the roof, entertaining the kids. And the cool thing is, first of all, there was a zero cost to the hospital. No productivity was lost. Like the window cleaning company paid for the uniforms. So it, it didn't require a big investment. But the thing is, it made a big difference. Mm -hmm. when, when those kids see the window washers dressed up like superheroes, their eyes light up. And, and it, it takes the attention away from the medical care. But in fact, the kids look forward to it for days. So it's deeply rewarding. It makes a huge difference for the kids. And the funny thing is the window washers also benefit. You know, before they were doing a rather mundane job. And now when they see those kids light up, it gives them purpose and meaning to their work. And, you know, to be clear, this did not make a billion dollars, but you know mm -hmm. what? It made a difference. Mm -hmm. And the thing is that I, I believe, and actually I don't just believe, I know that all of us have ideas like that floating around inside of us. And so I think it's our responsibility to bring them to the surface because it can not only drive better business outcomes, it can, it can help our families and our communities alike. I have a really good example of, of maybe not something as, as cool as the window washer story, but in terms of thinking about a creative way for us to build relationships with brokers we work with, when I talk about Evolve, our cyber insurance business, we had an employee that um, was working with a broker, found out that the broker was a huge fan of a specific band. And instead of like a lot of times in our industry, it's taking folks out to, to lunch or dinner or drinks or coffee or something like that. Um, this particular employee took this broker to a concert, which ended up being cheaper than taking a broker to dinner. It had far greater impact on the relationship. They bonded. The experience was amazing. And, um, so based on that, we are going to have a section of our sales meetings that is devoted to um, coming up with creative ways to have an impact on relationships, insurance, we're in the relationship business. So uh, I'm really excited to see how that works out. One question I had that applies to maybe, um, I, I would just like to hear the differential between large business like Fortune 500 companies and small business. I know you've worked with lots of Fortune 500 companies. Do they think about innovation or creativity differently than small business? Well, I hate to group all big companies and all small companies alike, but I do think there's sort of big company thinking and small company thinking, which really doesn't apply to the size of the company. There are big companies that like think small and small companies that think clunky. So, so big company thinking is unfortunately, they, they've shifted away from, 
from building something and, and creating new ideas to protecting the old ones. And in big company thinking, it's it's often around CYA and making sure you don't screw up and you know kissing up to the boss and all that, which is uh, really can become a doom loop because they get into so much protectionism and they're unwilling to take any more responsible risks. That's why you have Oldsmobile and Pan Am Airlines and such. And so, so small company thinking is more around, hey, what, what can we do that's fresh and new? How can we reinvent instead of cling to the past? How can we push the creative boundaries and serve customers in new and fresh, better ways? Mm-hmm. And so again, I think it's more of a mindset than a company size thing, but big companies do tend to think like that because they got big because they were successful and then they want to protect the you know quote unquote golden goose. I think the antidote here is making sure that that innovation is rewarded. Some, some companies that are big do things like they say, um, a certain percentage, let's say 20% of the revenue of the company has to come from new products, you know, products or services that were invented in the last five years. Um, companies, big companies like Ben and Jerry do something, they do something pretty fun. They're mm-hmm. very fast to retire old products to make room for new ones. In fact, they actually do something called a business funeral where they literally bury, they have a graveyard in the backyard of their company headquarters in Vermont. So when a flavor is no longer successful anymore, they take it out back and they give it a champagne toast and a, and a eulogy, <laughs> and then they let it go. So now they have room for something new. So again, big companies can can be scrappy and creative if, if they're willing to do so. Okay, okay. If I am approaching a particular business issue or a category of business that I think could be improved, I know you have a couple strategies that are specific about ways you can shift your mindset. The first one that comes to mind is, I believe it's the judo flip. Can you walk through some of these strategies to really like put yourself in the mindset of like, let me let me think about some outside of the box ways to bring a solution to this issue? Yeah, so there's a technique that I developed over the years. I call it the judo flip. And so let's say you're trying to solve a new problem or, or seize an opportunity. Maybe it's win a new client. Whatever you happen to be working on. And so rather than just gravitating to the tried and true, you start by sort of taking a quick inventory. Like, how have you always done this before? What does everybody else in the insurance industry tend to do in a situation like this? And once you list out the obvious, that the conventional approaches, you draw a line down the page and simply ask yourself next to every entry, what's the polar opposite? What would it look like if I judo flipped it? And so judo flipping is forcing yourself to do the opposite of what's expected and in turn can yield uh, outstanding results. You know, one, one fun example of this I, I learned recently, I guess in competitive swimwear, like if you wear, you know, you're racing swimsuits, there's a saying in the industry, you want a faster swimsuit, it goes smaller, smoother, faster, which is why you have Speedos. <laughs> anyway, this, this woman named Fiona Fairhurst takes over as the head of innovation for Speedo. And she's charged with coming up with the fastest swimsuit on earth. So the obvious answer, yes, smaller, smoother, faster. But instead, Fiona decides to judo flip it. And she goes out and starts studying things that swim fast, like boats and animals, and eventually leads her to sharks. Well, sharks obviously don't wear speedos, and and shark skin isn't even smooth. It's got these little ridges in it that allows the shark to swim faster underwater. Well, Fiona invents something called the Speedo Fast Skin Bathing Suit, which instead of being small and smooth, it's a judo flip. It's, It's large and not smooth. In other words, it's like a bodysuit. It covers the swimmer from their neck down to their, their ankles and all the way down their arms. And the material itself has the same ridges that she observed in shark skin. It's not smooth. So it's neither small nor smooth. It's a judo flip. The result, within two years of its launch, it became the standard for fast uh, swim bathing suits and was responsible for winning 80% of championship medals around the world. Wow. And, and by the way, before that came along, everyone would have said, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why does someone need to mess with it? Why, you know, and I hate that phrase, by the way. I don't know who came up with that. It's a terrible piece of advice. If yeah. it ain't broke, don't fix it. So Fiona did something different. She said, hey, this isn't broke, but I'm going to fix it anyway. And she invents the Spaskin bathing suit. She became wildly successful. It was a huge economic win, great for swimmers alike. So I think that's the kind of judo flip mindset that we need to get into. We don't want to just say, hey, it's working. Why should I mess with it? Because that would assume that your competitors are going to stand still. You know, okay. if, if something's working you for now and you have a head start, great. Leverage that head start, but make sure that you're judo flipping your way to new possibilities. Okay. Okay. That's an excellent strategy. An excellent takeaway that the audience can implement right away. Beyond judo flip, is there any other mindsets that you think people can utilize to to bring a new approach to an issue? 
Sure. And I would probably describe that judo club as more of a tactic actually than a mindset. Um, okay. Another tactic uh, that's kind of fun is simply called the borrowed idea, the borrowed idea, which, you know, obviously folks listening are, are deeply involved in the insurance industry, you know, professionals. And of course, we all study the industry and our competitors. But when you want something fresh, it's helpful sometimes to look outside of our normal worldview. And so you might look outside into an, an adjacent industry or into nature or sports. Actually, Fiona borrowed the idea from shark skin. So that was a borrowed idea in addition to a judo flip. And, and you know, one, one kind of cool example of this, I guess that serious burns on, on human beings, uh, it's one of the worst things that can happen. I mean, it's very, very painful. It requires months or years uh, to heal, leaves disfiguring, scarring. And the way it's generally treated is they overlay human cadaver skin on an open wound. Like the whole thing is awful. Mm -hmm. And it's been done about the same way for, for you know, decades. Anyway, these researchers, instead of studying other uh, burn treatments, they, they looked into graffiti artists. And it turns out that the, when, when a graffiti artist is tagging a building, like in a city, they're able to spray on controlled layers of paint. It's a very, very controlled and smooth process. So borrowing from graffiti artists, these researchers invented something called the skin gun, which is basically like, like a, 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 a spray paint gun, but, but to help burn victims. It uses saline solution and the, uh, the, the patient's stem cells. And what they're able to do is spray on a very thin regenerative layer of skin. And, and the results are stunning. A burn that would take you know months and months to heal, if at all, is cured within a matter of days. And, and the reason I bring this up is that the breakthrough didn't come by studying everybody else in their field. It came by borrowing from an outside factor, in this case, graffiti artists. That's a huge point for the insurance world because we can be a little bit complacent in our industry just based around the fact that we have renewals, the fact that insurance has been around for so long. We have so many, you know, historical factors that go into what we do on a regular basis, looking into other industries, I think is a, is a great point. Um, I mean, even something as simple as how you, how you dress and how your office is like, like I, I uh, my dad, by the way, was it was an insurance professional. So I, I say this with love, but oh, cool. you know, you can you can pull off one person's logo and slap on another one. Like you can hardly tell the difference. They're they're sort of the same vibe in many cases. Yeah. So I might say, well, what what would instead of the mahogany desk and and Windsor not? What if you know when you go to an art gallery, that's kind of a cool vibe. What if your entire office was felt like an art gallery? Yeah. And what if you had like cool dim lighting? And what if you wore a black turtleneck instead of a suit? You know, and you know what might happen? You might alienate 5% of your audience. They're like, oh, I don't want to buy insurance from someone unless they're looking in a, in a, in a, in a, in a suit from Mervyn's. Yeah. But I would say the other people might light up like, oh my gosh, is it about time that someone looks and acts a little different has a, has an artistic angle to their practice? So I'm not saying that's the right thing for every person on this that's listening to do. My only mm -hmm. point is let's shake it up a little bit. Let's not be a lookalike competitor. Let's be the competitor that stands out. And one way to do that is from borrowing. Maybe we we borrow a cool element from a coffee shop and we, uh -huh. we implement that in our office. I really like that. One thing I've noticed with insurance agency names is like 99% of them are actual names. Like it's like a last person's name or a person's full name, you know, uh, Dave Costello insurance agency. Right. And, uh, that was, that was when we were talking about the name for evolve for our cyber insurance MGA, it was like, you know, we, we kind of wanted to flip the switch there on how we we're going to go about branding ourselves. So I think that's, that's a great takeaway. Um, are there any other tactics that you think the insurance world could use when rethinking about how they go about their business? Well, there's, there's a bunch of them. You know, I've been, I've been studying innovation and creativity for, for years and years. And, um, and, and so actually I, I wanted to give a bit of a, of a gift to, to the folks um, listening today. So um, there is a, um, I, I built a website. It's called biglittlebreakthroughs.com. It's free. I'm not selling anyone anything. There's nothing to buy. But there's a whole bunch of tools there. There's an assessment tool. There's a quick start guide. There's a downloadable worksheet of dozens of tactics like the judo flip and the borrowed idea. Oh, so if you check out biglittlebreakthroughs.com and go to, there's a toolkit tab, it does require a password. So I'm going to make the password for anyone listening uh, today evolve. And so if you go to biglittlebreakthroughs.com, use the password evolve, you'll have access to a whole bunch of goodies and techniques and, and mindsets alike. Thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate that. Sure. 
there's no doubt our industry could use a little creativity. And one big misconception, I feel like people only apply the word creativity to the marketing department, right? I think it, it's something that's got to be applied to every department. Have you, have you experienced that misconception? I have. It, and, you know, people often mistakenly attribute levels of creativity to job title. So marketing is creative, accounting is not. Uh, you know, R and D yeah. is creative, legal is not. Exactly. And and I'll, I'll tell you that that couldn't be further from the truth. First of all, all human beings, regardless of title, are are creative. Doesn't mean we're all creative in the same ways. By the way, like I play jazz guitar pretty well. I can't draw a stick figure if I tried. So if you looked at me drawing, you'd say this person is not creative at all. If you heard me playing music, you'd say something different. So my point is, whether or not you're good at interpretive dance or poetry or whatever, it doesn't matter. You can be creative in the way you interview a job candidate or the way that you pitch a new policy to, to a client. Um, so there really is room for creativity in every role. And in fact, I think the best organizations cultivate innovation, creative problem solving, inventive thinking at every box on the org chart. You know, you want your, your, your finance team to be creative. Mm -hmm. now, I don't say that's silly. Like, I'm not saying they should cheat on your tax. Of course not. But when I say creative, maybe that you're going to interpret a financial uh, report in a way that allows you to see an insight to make a better decision next time. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you're going to spot a new opportunity for margin expansion. So the point is that regardless of, of role or title, there's always room to be creative. And when we do so, then our entire organization becomes more competitive, more successful. Yeah. I can totally stand behind what you just said, I think everybody has creativity within them. We actually just saw that at our company retreat where we do something that was inspired by the show Hard Knocks, which actually the, the newest season is the Detroit Lions. But almost every NFL team has um, the rookies do a presentation that shows a little bit about their personality. And so we've actually been doing this for years now. And it is amazing to see what individuals will come to the table with certain people sang songs, certain people um, gave presentations on how to embarrass their children. Um, <laughs> one girl did a, a presentation on her life according to early 2000s songs, uh, the song titles. Um, you know, w one guy up it went up and just did a bunch of jokes and uh, it was phenomenal. I, I look forward to it every year. And I'm always impressed. And it's so cool to see uh, the personality that's shown. So I'm with you. I think that everybody has creativity within them. And uh, it just comes out in, in different ways. One point you make about creativity and innovation is sometimes it's actually ignited in an even more powerful way when you have limited resources which is counterintuitive because you think the more resources you have, the more creative you can be. Can you speak to having limited resources and how that could spark innovation? Yeah, we often think like, oh, I want to be creative, but I don't have enough. And then it's like a fill in the blank. I don't have enough money. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough bandwidth. I don't have enough people. But my, my, my loving and playful response is, if the amount of external resources you had equaled your level of creativity, the federal government would be the most creative organization on the planet. <laughs> and you know what would be the least creative? Startups. We know exactly the opposite is true. So, so what we, we have to recognize is that, you know, they always say, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. Yeah, exactly. And resource constrained situations, which are inevitable in business, actually can ignite creativity rather than restrict it. It's funny. I, I mentioned earlier, I played play guitar. Mm -hmm. I put, put myself through college playing music and I had a professor that would force me to remove strings from the guitar. Okay. And I would have to take off up to three strings at a time. So now you're thinking about this, okay, I went from six strings to three, my resources are cut in half. You'd say, well, yeah, your creativity is... Surprising thing happened. When, when the strings were off, I could no longer rely on the patterns that I knew. In other words, I was forced to solve musical problems in a fresh way. And actually my creativity accelerated. And, and once again, I know it's, it's a natural instinct. It's not a criticism, but, but we can overcome that, that feeling of being overwhelmed because we're resource constrained. Creativity is the way through. You know, mm -hmm. it's sort of like, it's like a heat map calling your creative soul to the surface. Josh, you've run and started multiple businesses. When you look back at all of your involvement with those businesses, is there a particular innovation that you implemented that you look back on and you're like, that's my favorite one. That's my best one. That's the one that had the biggest impact. Does anything come to mind? 
it, it's it's hard because you know I, I I try to cultivate high volume of of little innovations more than big mm-hmm. ones. Mm-hmm. One that kind of comes to mind is fun. So I was building my company. I started a company in '99 called ePrize. We were in the digital promotion space. Anyway, by about 2004, we were really the market leader. It wasn't a big industry, but we were the dominant leader. And I was worried that my folks were going to get complacent. You know, often uh, uh, best performance is achieved in the face of competition. And since we didn't have a big, ugly enemy competitor, we were so far ahead of others, I made up a fake competitor, a make-believe nemesis named the Slither Corporation. <laughs> and, and what I did is at a full company meeting, I introduced everybody. I said, hey, guys, I found out there's a company out there that's faster than us, smarter, more profitable, better clients, better investors. Meet the Slither Corporation. And, and everybody knew that it was fake. I wasn't lying to them. But the notion of this ideal competitor that was out there, that was always a step ahead of us, that never missed a beat, you know, that became like a rallying cry. And so now our whole culture started to shift. We, we started to say things like, hey, what's your counterpart at Slither doing differently than you? Or we would like intercept uh, um, reports from what Slither was doing. Or even if we went to solve a problem, instead of me saying, hey, how should we you know, improve uh, speed in our production process? If I ask that question, people might clam up. They don't want to offend somebody. But if I said, hey, our spies just got a report that Slither improved their, their processing time. How do you think they did it over at Slither? Everybody was happy to share ideas and speculate. So this notion of, and I don't mean to be glib, I know in the insurance world, they're real competitors. But, mm-hmm. but the notion of inventing the ultimate competitor that is backed by Warren Buffett and, 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 and Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates, and they're there to take you down. Like, what would they do differently? How would they hire? What would their office look like? How would they train their, their, their insurance professionals? So it's an interesting way to think about it. And that was a fun thing. And it, it, that idea had been written up in, in Fast Company and Inc. Magazine and a bunch of others. That's awesome. That's super unique. I haven't heard of anyone else doing that. For your new book, Josh, I have not read it yet. Is there anything, let's just say maybe like three major takeaways that you think would be good for the insurance world? Um, yeah, you know, so in, in, in Big Little Breakthroughs, again, we really cover this notion of, of cultivating everyday innovation. So one of them is saying, recognize there's different flavors of innovation. It doesn't have to be a billion dollar idea to count. So, so that's one. Um, there are a couple of mindsets that I think are, are helpful. One of them is, um, is start before you're ready. And, and the notion is that, you know, often when we see an opportunity or a challenge, we just freeze up instead of get going. Like we, we're, I, I got to wait for ideal conditions or until I get permission. And the most innovative people just get started, even though they can't see the finish line. And they're willing to adapt to changing conditions and sort of bob and weave along the way in order to get there first. So that's one, start before you're ready. Okay. Another one that I thought was kind of fun is a phrase that I call, don't forget the dinner mint. So imagine you go to a nice restaurant, you have an awesome meal. At the end, they say, hey, uh, Mr. Casello, there's a little, little chocolate that the chef thought you might enjoy. Well, if you look at the cost of that chocolate compared to the cost of their real estate and their insurance and their team members and their food and the marketing and stuff, negligible. But that little dinner mint made a difference in your experience. Like that was this unexpected surprise and delight moment and it made your meal transcendent. So as an insurance professional, you say to yourself, okay, if I were to take 1% more effort, time, money, et cetera, is there some type of thing that I could add that would make me stand out from the competitive pack? It could be something physical, like, like an actual mint, but it could be a little extra layer of service. Maybe it's that you hand deliver every time you have a, a report on your, your policy. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's a, it's a little special something that you do, a little creative twist. And so the thing is, it's, it's a high leverage activity. In other words, a 1% or less extra bit of effort or creativity might have a 100% difference in terms of success rate, especially in a field like insurance, where it's binary. You either win the, the client or you don't. That little extra something can go a very long way. I really like that. I really like that. Yeah. The dinner mint. I love dinner mints personally as well. <laughs> there you go. Cool. Uh, well, I encourage everyone out there to um, check out your books. Hacking Innovation was uh, very uniquely interesting to me. And I have to get your new one for anybody out there listening that's interested in seeing you speak. I know the world has now opened back up and I'm sure you have a booked schedule for speaking events. Is there anywhere in 2022 that people can see you or even in 2023 if they're looking to um, catch you in person? 
Yeah, thank, thank you for asking. Most of the events that I do are private events more than, than public like ticketed events. But you know, if anyone wants to get in touch, I'd say check out biglittlebreakthroughs.com. Um, there's a bunch of great goodies there. And uh, and again, make sure that you use the, the secret code of Evolve uh, in order to get into all, all the free stuff. Um, but you feel free to check out my website, just joshlinkner.com. And uh, there's all kinds of speaking information in my email and anything else you want. Any way I could be helpful. And of course, I'm on social media and all channels just at Josh Linkner. Cool. That sounds good. That's perfect. Well, Josh, we always end with five rapid fire questions that we've curated. Some are, are personal, some are professional. So if you are ready, I can dive in. Fire away. So from your website, it looks like you've written four books. If you had to choose, which one is your personal favorite? Big Little Breakthroughs by far. It's, uh, it's my most recent book. It's better written than the other ones. And it's a lot of fun. So I, I, it's, like, it's hard because it's like I have four kids and I wouldn't want to choose my favorite kid. Uh -huh. But my favorite book, I can choose Big Little Breakthroughs. <laughs> okay. Okay. Question number two. Who is your favorite innovator of all time? Oh, it's so hard. I may have to say uh, John Coltrane. John Coltrane was a saxophonist, a jazz saxophonist, and he, he pioneered a whole new style of music. He wrote the song called Giant Steps, which basically broke the rules of jazz as far as you could break them. And in turn became one of the most prolific works of all time. So he's a personal hero of mine just because I like how he was a, a rule breaker and in turn unlocked creative genius. Cool, cool. I don't know a ton about uh, music and, and particularly jazz, but isn't jazz based around kind of going outside the norm or, you know, I don't know. Maybe you can fill me in on that a little bit. It is. Jazz is a very, uh, it's spontaneous creativity. Only 1% yeah. of the notes are, are written on the page and then you, the rest you have to figure it out. It's kind of like a, okay. a conversation like you and I are having. It's unscripted and yeah. you just sort of riff off of one, uh, one another. And it's kind of dangerous. Sometimes you make mistakes, you have to course correct, but, but when it's done right, you know, it's just a beautiful art form that I just, it's like, yeah. I mean, imagine, you know, the, creating, and, and composing and performing art in real time. And then, you know, in front of a live audience. And that, that's kind of what jazz is. Okay. All right. Question number three. Today, I know I personally had a nitro cold brew from Starbucks. I hear that you're a caffeine junkie. What is your daily caffeine routine? Well, I, here it is. It's almost three in the afternoon, Eastern time. And I'm I still got a warm cup of coffee next to me. So I'm probably a three, three cup a day guy, but big cups. So, you know, I, it's definitely a vice that I, I probably should, should take down a notch or two, but uh, I'm a big fan. And I, I like Starbucks, of course, and I also like Bulletproof coffee a lot. Oh, okay, cool. I actually just went to a Bulletproof coffee retail location in Santa Monica. Nice. So I'm with, it, it seems like it's working out for you though. So, um, okay. Ne question number four. Obviously, you do a ton of keynote speeches. After going through your website, it looks like you got a pretty unique process to creating a keynote speech, which is probably different from most people out there that give them. Can you give us some insight into your process for creating a keynote speech? Well, we could, we could spend hours on this very topic. I really do study the, the craft. Um, but one, one, one suggestion I would say is thinking about structure. So uh, like a good movie or a book, there, there should be a distinct beginning, middle, and an end, each with their own objectives. A, a keynote speech shouldn't start with a how, it should start with why. So you should really talk about the case that you're making, why people should care, and, and get people leaning into, um, again, what, what, what the topic is and why it's important to them. Then, and only then, should you get into the subject matter and the content of how to do something or how to affect a change. And then, of course, the end, you want to bring it home strong like a fireworks finale. All right, nice. Final question, number five. It sounds like you are a pizza lover. This is a two-part question. What is your favorite pizza place in Detroit, and can you explain the Detroit-style pizza? Well, I am a pizza lover. It's the perfect food. You can eat it with one hand. It's portable. It's like a blank canvas. You can put anything on it. It's just the greatest food ever. Um, but, um, I, and by the way, I love pizza of all styles. I love New York pizza. 
I love uh, Sicilian pizza. I, I love uh, Neapolitan pizza. But I will say that Detroit is, of course, the best, partly because I'm from Detroit. Um, Detroit-style pizza is about half the thickness of Chicago pizza. It's not as thick of a pie. And it's 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 crunchy. It's square pizza, cr- crunch around the edges. Okay. And, and they put the cheese down first and the sauce over the top. And so that's a little different. The cheese goes all the way to the edge of the pie. Ah. And it's, it's, it's baked and crunchy on the outside. And it's just unbelievable. Highly recommend you try it. Um, Jets Pizza is a national brand that, that is Detroit style pizza. I oh. think uh, Pizza Hut may be experimenting with it, but I, I tried Jets. That's pretty close on a national basis. And by the way, now in most cities, if you type in like Denver, D- Detroit Pizza, you, you'll find a place making authentic style Detroit pizza. Okay. But your first question was, which is my favorite in Detroit? Yeah. It's, of course, the OG, the original Buddy's Pizza. And they wow. were, in fact, the inventors of Detroit style pizza. And in my mind, still the number one best. That's really cool to hear. Um, I have never tried Detroit style pizza. I was actually just listening to a podcast with the guy that founded Papa John's. And it sounds like he is a consultant to Jets. And I did not realize that they're Detroit style. So are there, are there a national brand? Jets is a national brand. And funny enough, in Detroit, talk about pizza, headquarters of Little Caesars, headquarters of Hungry Howie's, and headquarters of Jets. And then Domino's is right in Ann Arbor, which is only like huh. 20 minutes from here. So you got like four of the top 10 major pizza brands in in, in the Metro Detroit area. Pretty kind, wow. of, it's kind of fun. Watch out New York. You know? Watch out New York. <laughs> well, Josh, thank you so much for the time and the insight today. Uh, I know your time is valuable and um, you're constantly being requested to discuss innovation, creativity, and you have a ton going on with your businesses, um, with your books and with your engagements. So it is hugely appreciated. And uh, I know you mentioned all of the ways that folks can find you via your website, but uh, I would love to catch up with you soon. And if there's anything you ever need, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks so much. Congrats on the, on the podcast. It's great. Great pleasure to be with you. Thanks, Josh. Please download, subscribe, and leave a review on whatever platform you are listening on. And feel free to reach out to me at pat at evolvedbrokerpodcast.com with any comments or suggestions for the podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by First Insurance Funding. First is the leading premium finance company in insurance and is known throughout the industry for their personalized service and quote flexibility. If you're tired of sending quote requests for smaller premiums to multiple companies, not leaving enough time to negotiate larger opportunities, then choose First as your primary financing source and experience the first difference today. 